Hey, we got a forest fire that ignited and it's raging across the valley here. Stay tuned, I'm gonna give you more stats on it and uh, share some uh, fire mitigation that we've got set up. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Southern Oregon Safaris where the buffalo roam. I'm Jerry. Hayden is convalescing in his house right down the hill here. I'm standing on top of the mountain where he was uh, arranging his uh, hip camp and he also has his very large water tank set up for water storage and firefighting suppression. We're going to share a little bit about that with you, Baga. But right now, I want you to focus the attention on this big plume of fire back here. Now, this fire does uh, is uh, between the towns of Eagle Point, Oregon, and Butte Falls. If the fire were to move eastward, it would uh, blow right towards Butte Falls. Uh, but right now the winds are either blowing south on the surface and then northeast on the uh, a higher elevation. So let's just keep our fingers crossed and hope it doesn't go towards Butte Falls. Now this area, I want to point out, was burnt out in previous years, three years ago I think it was been, when they had the big open chain fire. And that fire was sparked by high winds that caused power lines to come in contact with each other and send sparks into dry brush. I have uh, an acquaintance that actually witnessed this happen. So he was the Oregon Fire Marshal's eyewitness to the ignition point of the fire. Anyway, that's the fire we're dealing with right now. And here's a kind of a reboot of some of the things that Hayden and I went over as far as his fire suppression um, infrastructure he has in place here at Southern Oregon Safaris where the buffalo roam. Hey, uh, today's episode, Hayden's gonna walk us through his fire mitigation setup he's got. Mainly this big tank and some water hydrants to fight wildfires. We'll be right back. Coming back soon. So welcome back to the next episode of Southern Oregon Safaris and... Where the Buffalo Roam. Well, here we are today. We're going, we've promised that we were gonna discuss uh, the fire system here on the ranch that we've been creating for a number of years. And we're pretty much almost done. I'm, I'm really close to having this thing working out. Um, I've got one of the lines charged now actually. And we've got a couple little more adjustments I'm going to do on the water tank. We're going to discuss the water tank and why we did it and how we did it and what it took. Okay. So anyway, what we have here is a, uh, I believe this tank's about 37 feet long and it's about 12 foot round. And if I remember correctly, it's right around 22,000 gallons or so. Don't hold me to that, but that's about roughly what it is. It's a half inch wall commercial tank and it was actually used to hold transformer cooling oil for a big uh, electric plant. And so this thing had was full trans uh, um, the transmission power line the big boxes that, that they have the oil on them and it, so it circulates that oil and cools them and this was all storage for that so definitely not potable water i wouldn't call it potable water but i did have it tested oh. i did get it tested to make sure that there was no uh, cancer causing or any real strong forever chemicals as they call them and there wasn't it tested clean so it's basically a heavy mineral oil but who knows what comes through those coils when they're heated up super hot conductors and oh, then that's true. going through that i'm sure there's some decaying in there but i tested it for a bunch of different things and everything came back clear but no we will not be drinking this water anybody it's <laughs> not a good idea so anyway this water is basically for a fire system and there's actually two of these tanks so jerry the funny story on this tank is we got this at an auction so it was an auction that was a uh, it was actually a hardware store that was closing but this auction house had uh, got a hold of somebody else and they uh, brought some other uh, filler items in onto the auction. So these were not on the property where the auction was, but there was a couple of these tanks like this and nobody dared to bid on them because of the sheer size and weight 
everybody laughed and said, there's no way anybody's gonna get those moved. And when I, you know, when they finally said sold to me, uh, everybody turned and laughed and said, good luck moving those darn things. And I knew kind of what I was getting into because I've done a lot of crazy stuff like this my whole life. So it, it's a heavy son of a gun. Empty this tank's over 22,000 pounds. It is heavy. It's really heavy wallet. Like I said, it's commercial. Just the, the four legs underneath these underneath it, they're uh, over almost uh, three quarter inch thick steel. And each one of these, if I remember right, were about 3,000 pounds. Wow. So there's about 12,000 pounds just sitting underneath it to hold it up and hold its sheer weight. Um, but anyway, I wound up paying, uh, I believe I paid $300 for this tank and 200 for the other one. Oh, wow. You are resourceful. <laughs> yes. But again, you know, everybody laughed and said, oh, he'll never get it moved. And I actually moved this thing by myself pretty much. I had this guy uh, lifted onto a trailer and I hauled it on a Sunday evening home and literally had to lift up the uh, telephone lines with a piece of PVC to get underneath it because of the oh. size of it. Sitting on a trailer, it was tall enough that it was bumping the, the telephone lines. Oh, my. So I had to literally stop at, at under each telephone line, lift it up with a PVC pipe and then drive under. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then getting it off was another treat because wow. it, it's heavy. And so I literally tried everything to get this thing on, even onto its pedestals. Yeah. And it was so heavy, nothing I have would move it. And I have a lot of heavy equipment, but nothing would move it. So I called my buddy who has a hay squeeze. He tried to lift it up, couldn't lift it up. So we wound up finally doing is a f neighbor here uh, has an ex a big excavator, really heavy, like a 40,000 pounder. And it didn't want to lift it. But with his excavator, my excavator together, we were just able to get it onto these pedestals. Oh. So... But I'm I'm really excited about this project because I've got I don't have a lot into the tank part of it, which is the most expensive part of it. Yeah. And what it can do is marvelous. I mean, this is all this water on a three-inch line going all the way down. When you'll see, we're up really high compared to the rest of the property. This is a hilly property, so we have gravity flow going down to the hydrants. Each um, each uh, structure has a hydrant on it, coming off a three-inch valve, and the amount of pressure and volume coming off this thing is insane. So um, this thing's gonna be just awesome for fighting fires. I'm really uh, I'm excited to have it. I hope I never have to use it. I don't really want to try it, but I know it's gonna do its job. It's nice to know that it's here and you have it available. It's here, and I mean, living out here is a wonderful place to live, but the fire hazard is, it just starts to really wear on you. Every summer, especially the last seven years with this drought, um, we've had just massive wildfires all around us. This year we've been very lucky. I'm grateful so far. Nothing major around close by. We've had some real white knucklers. Yes. So yeah, we've had some really white knuckle rides. And you've experienced the same thing. Yeah. It's just these fires that come so close. And we really are in a great situation because we've cleared thousands and thousands, if not tens of thousands of trees in the last 10 years and give ourselves a lot of defensible space, which is really important. We're outside the fire district, so we're not going to yes. have the fire department to help us. We're kind of on our own in a way. So um, we've had a lot of close calls. We've had uh, some fires from lightning strikes up on the back part of the property we had to put out ourselves. Uh, we did get a little bit of assistance from the BLM, uh, Grayback and all them uh, did jump in on it, but we were, we were lucky that they brought us a couple loads of water with a, with a helicopter. So thank God for that. One thing I did learn from when we were filming our reality show on Discovery Channel, mm. uh, Homestead Rescue is the name of the show. I learned this valley where we live has the highest density of wildfires per capita in the nation uh, because we average i've lived up here 30 years raised my kids from little tykes uh, up here on a ranch down the road and then we bought the property just uh, across the street from yeah. you but uh every single year and i only count the wildfires that happen within a 10 mile radius of the house really we average three a year every single year for the last 30 years except last year we did not have one thank heaven <laughs> that's all i can say because uh, i tell you what it's been it's not been fun so uh, i do understand the criticalness yeah of wildfire defense yeah. set up well, we try to have as much, uh, we try to fireproof as much as we can. We try to get as much defensible space as we can. Um, like I said, we've taken out so many trees every year and we've got it down pretty good, but we still do have some. We try to get all the underbrush and all the ladder fuel out. Um, I've tried to like make my buildings mostly out of concrete and steel, like the Rhino building. We completely got rid of all the wood on that building. Uh, one day I'd hopefully be able, hope to be able to afford to do that with the elephant barn, but we've got enough water, enough safe space around the elephant barn. Um, our house, unfortunately, is a log house. So that's one thing that's one of the main reasons that we definitely need to have enough uh, ways to fight a fire off that structure. Um, and the house up on the other side of the hill where my parents live, same thing, it's a wood structure. Um, so yeah, what's well, all we can do is just you know do everything we can to try to be prepared for it. 
We've got lots of equipment on hand. I do have, we do have a water truck on the property, a 4,000 gallon six by six big international. It's an old son of a gun, but it's a great truck that I also bought at an auction. As long as it does the job. It does the job. Yeah. And, and it's, but the thing is, is the pump on that thing, it'll empty itself in less than 12, 13 minutes. Oh. So 4,000 gallons gone that quick. And then to refill it is a 30 minute process. Oh my. On, and if you're using a hose, it would take all day. Yeah. So this thing, I'll be able to reload that truck in a matter of five minutes. Nice. With the volume and pressure I have. Plus you got hydrant set out. Yeah, so basically pull the truck right up to the hydrant. I don't even have to Mitigating the fire around structures. Exactly. So, and we have all the fire hose reels and all that. And so once we get the uh, this system done, every station or every structure will have its own fire hose on its own reel with all the, 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 the tools and the keys and the nozzles and all that. So that way, you don't have to go get it in case of fire, it's right there. And then we keep a lot of chainsaws on hand. We've got uh, a lot of our neighbors have dozers and excavators. I have a bunch of heavy equipment, but we have enough help and support uh, to fight stuff. But the, again, the big problem is when you have these kind of animals, you're not, every time there's a fire close by, you're not gonna evacuate. No. It's just, it's too complicated. You got a bigger chance of hurting something. Defend in place. Hurting yourself. So we're prepared to defend and stand our ground. And that's yeah. what we did. We had a fire when we were down in Southern California on our old ranch uh, called the Station Fire. Um, and that thing burned right through the property and we lost no animals. We were able to defend ourselves because I had put a fire system there that worked and did its job and all the animals. Uh, My son is a wildland firefighter. In That's fact, he's deployed that. out to uh, La Grande, Oregon right now. He fought that fire. I remember the, the name fire. of it. He was sent to California the year that yeah. fire went through. Yeah, I mean, back then that was considered, I think, one of the most destructive California wildfires in history, but that was now going, what year was that? I don't even remember, but probably 2011 or something 2009 i don't remember the exact i'll have to look that up so don't quote me on that date <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah that's about when that came through and that fire burned for weeks and weeks and weeks and did a, just an unbelievable amount of destruction oh my but we, we survived it and no loss of life and we were happy about that we did lose a lot of our belongings i had a lot of uh, out structures that had our storage units oh, burned dear. to the ground but we saved the house and saved all the animals and some of the structures the animals were destroyed but we fixed them so Fire is a nasty thing. You, when yeah. you live out in these environments, you have to be prepared. Oh yeah. If so. you, you know, and we love living out in the wilderness. It's just away from the hecticness of the yep. city. But it comes at a price. Yeah. So uh, Jerry, what I'm getting ready to do is uh, the last part of this setup on this tank is I have not uh, finalized my fill line. I've got a 90 going up top, but I need to go a 90 inside the tank so we can start filling the tank up. The tank is full mostly right now, but I think it's about, uh, it needs about 1500 gallons added to it because I've been testing a line and that line, that whole line going down to the, the all the structures, I bet you that thing holds, that three inch line is probably holding about a thousand gallons because every time we have uh, filled it and then realized we had a leak and then drained it, the f tank's gone down a foot or so. All right. Wow. So we're for about two foot from the top right now, so I need to add some more. So I just need to get that fill line done. So I'm gonna climb up there real quick right now, button that up and then we'll go down and see the rest of this fire system and, and get into some other stuff. Using okay. Elephant foot work today. Let's watch you work. They need their feet trimmed. <laughs> it's gonna be toe day. Uh, what do they call it? Pet pedicure day. Oh, okay. All right. This stuff nobody wants. When people start panicking about moving something heavy and freaking out, that's the one I go for because I know nobody's gonna pay for it so they don't bid on me. And the girls can look at my butt. Exactly. <laughs> Check out the cheeks. Shit, did I just do that backwards? I did just do that So now we're down here at this hydrant. That was, what is this, a three inch? That's all three inch galvanized. And obviously you don't want plastic sticking above ground because as soon as you have a fire, that'll melt and then you lose all your water. So that won't do you any good. But this stuff's getting really costly. Any kind of metal, anything is insane. I mean, the valves, everything's gone up exponentially since we've had all this hyperinflation. Uh, I did my last property on four inch. There's no way you could do that these days. It's just way, way expensive. Even the three inch was difficult, but you have to have at least three inch for any fire department or any fire apparatus that would come, they won't pull off anything that's less than three inch. So if you had a two or two and a half inch, they won't even, they won't even bother with it. Good to know. So, so you need the, it's the volume and all that that the three inch gives. So three inch minimum, four inch is obviously better 
you know, obviously more volume, more pressure, but um, this is the best we can do in our, on our budget. Um, so at each one of these stations, there's, a, there's gonna be one of these hydrants at every structure on the property. This one's in front of the red barn, which is next to the rhino barn and where the ostriches are. Uh, this will be outfitted eventually with a hose reel, its own nozzle and all the tools and everything that you need to connect your fire hose. And then if, if I uh, wind up getting say uh, Grayback or any of the uh, BLM guys come out and they're helping to fight a fire, they'll build a pump off of these and they'll use, they'll, as long as my fittings are correct, they'll use my fittings to pull water to help fight a fire. If you don't, they'll just kind of go, you're on your own. <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I've had that happen where, you know, they get there and they're like, well, that's a good fitting, but we don't run that fitting. So we oh, can't no. hook up to it. So sorry. Too bad you, you sure can't have adapters that are quick connected. Well, that's why I usually do have a few adapters at every station to make sure because the fire department runs off different apparatus and different uh, fittings than, say, the BLM guys or the Grayback guys. Those guys use their own fittings. Yeah. So it depends on whether it's forestry or not, you know, if it's U.S. federal or if it's state, they all have sometimes use their own apparatus and, and fittings. So now, you know, we're way below where the tank is. The tank is probably at least 250 feet above our head. Believe it or not, it's way up on top of the hill behind us and the camera can't see it right now, but it's way up there. And so that amount of fall from here to there uh, creates quite a bit of pressure. And, pressure and that's what you need. Yes. Yeah. Because we want when you face your fire hose, you want that thing spraying yeah. far enough where you don't have to get too close to the flames. So yeah, that thing puts out some serious volume and pressure. How many hydrants do you have hooked on that tank? That tank is gonna have three hydrants on it when I'm done. Right now I have two on it. It'll have a third one added here soon. And then I've got another tank just like it up on the other hill okay. behind the other home up on that, up that hill. And that's even higher, that tank. So that tank's gonna even have more pressure and volume. And that one will have two hydrants on it. Two hydrants? One for the elephant barn and one for the house that's the structure that's up okay. there. Okay, have you thought about teeing them into the both lines? I have. You and I think a lot. <laughs> I have. There's a junction uh, by the elephant barn actually where I've connected them. They're not connected completely together yet but they're right up against each other and I just gotta, I'm gonna put a valve so I can switch them. So if one runs out of water or I want to double the pressure, I'll be able to combine the two good, tanks, pressure hitting. Good. So yeah, that's good that, planning. Great minds think alike. Yes, that way you're not going to run out of water too rapid. No. Nope. And what well, your your water source on filling the tanks? You're coming off of a well. What's Come, your GPMs on the uh, well? The wells. We have two wells on the property. It's a good thing you asked that because that's a good po pointer on this our important part of this property. Is I have two wells on the property. The front well is right around 65 gallons a minute which is uh, pretty darn good out here. I mean, a lot of the wells around here are yeah. lucky to draw three or four I'm gallons. across the street from me and I get 60. You get 60? I get well, 60 Well, that's, that's a really good well. That's yeah. a really strong well. Um, my other well on the other side is about 26 gallons. Okay. And so between the two, I mean, we're almost producing 100 gallons a minute between the two wells. So it'll take a while to fill that. Yes, you don't want to fill it. I, 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 I try not to tax my well so I don't fill it. I don't just open the valve and just let it run because you tax the heck out of the well. Yeah. So what I do is I fill it gradually over time. Um, um, so yeah, that's the best way to do that. Okay. Cool. That's why we keep it full. Good information. So Hayden, you've got a really good uh, infrastructure going on here with at least fire mitigation yeah. uh, on your water source, water resources you've got, which is very important, especially living when you're living and protecting what you're protecting like this structure back here and exactly. your animals. And animals and all that. And you know, we got buildings that are full of hay. And most of the buildings here are, we try to go with metal if we can for the, for the barns and all that. Uh, so they're somewhat fireproof, but the structure inside is wood and it has combustibles inside the building. So those are things we're trying to protect more than anything. Uh, the most important thing is keeping a lot of the fuel away from these structures. If you notice like this giant pine is probably what a hundred and about a hundred and something feet tall. Uh, last year we limbed that up almost 80 feet. Um, so that was that you know you see a lot of the pines, the bigger pines around here, we've limbed them up to get the ladder fuel away uh, because boy those become Solid fuel, you get flames two, 300 feet, and anything within 150 feet is combusted. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. So you keep the flame on the floor and just burn the gla grasses, exactly. it's easier Whether to control. You, it doesn't matter how much water you have. If you don't yeah. have control of your fuels, you don't manage those fuels, I don't care what water you throw yeah. on, you're not going to put it out. So, um, so yeah, so we're, we've really cleared everything back away from these structures, and we feel like we've got a pretty good grasp on stuff. You know, nature is unusual and things happen and i've seen fires do things the most strange yeah. things and nobody ever can explain how they do it or what they have what happened but you we feel i feel pretty confident at this point i can handle a pretty big fire but you know it really depends on what the wind is and the humidity in the air the very the fire comes through. unpredictable very unpredictable i've seen it so many times living up here with three wildfires yep. per year yep the fire just all of a sudden shifts direction very so unpredictable and surprise yeah. surprise it gets ahead of you yeah well, unfortunately, that fire is going to continue to rage. 
Hayden's going to continue to convalesce and get uh, better so his bones knit back together. If you guys don't know what happened to Hayden, check out the video I'm going to leave at the end of the show so you can see exactly what's going on with him if you missed that episode. I'm Jerry Hansen, Hayden's Convalescing. This is Southern Oregon Safaris where the Buffalo Room. Stay tuned to more videos. You could do that by subscribing, clicking that bell icon that alerts you to new videos as we upload them. Give us the thumbs up, click that share button. Sharing our videos on your social media platforms helps out the channel. We'll see you guys in our next adventure. This was, uh, well, by the seat of my pants. <laughs> I just drove by and saw it. It's like, oh, I got to get my cameras on this. So here you go.